I'm Natalie with Frecklepaw Family, and we've been doing this for a couple of years. We started with um, my girl that you met when we first met at Scotch Pines doing the training, and that was an amazing experience. Athena, so smart and so sweet. And from there, I fell in love with the whole process of raising puppies, being there for my mamas, and I loved raising puppies with my kids. Um, and it was definitely an education, finding out that a lot of breeders don't do any of the testing, don't do any of the things that make a dog have the best start in life. And so mm -hmm. finding out that that was a problem made me want to participate and learn that much more. So I'd already been kind of researching whether or not I wanted to get into any sort of like having puppies in our home, because it sounds like such an idyllic thing to do, have puppies, mm -hmm. raise kids at the same time, but I had no idea how much work it was and how much you really need to know to do it well. So it just started yeah. that journey with loving Athena and then starting adding females and improving um, and keeping in mind like future generations, making sure that we're doing it well. So mm -hmm. that's how it started. And we've started with Athena and we're all the way to Aurora is our newest and she's oh, completely really? different than Athena. They're all so different. <laughs> You said that you have kind of done things a little bit differently than other breeders. What would you say is like the biggest difference? I mean, I've watched you raise your puppies for years now and, and I've seen so many puppies come from programs like yours that are just set up for success. What makes your program different and what is kind of like the early start stuff that you do with them that's different than just having puppies and finding sure. homes for them? Um, there's just so many, um, there's a lot of variation from breeder to breeder, as you know, um, my experience while we were trying to find out what breed was best for us was that these puppies were being raised in environments that weren't enriching and they were coming to us. So we tried a Chihuahua, a Dachshund, a Cavalier, so many things, just trying to find the right fit for our family. And that was after we had researched, like that was after we we're like, okay, this is a good fit but they were coming from homes that were just, they're just making sure that they were clean and that was best case scenario. They weren't doing mm -hmm. with them that kind of prepared them for the next step in life, let alone health testing. I didn't even know to ask about that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so um, when I started, I realized I needed to ask good questions just in finding a puppy, not even like breeding questions. That's its own yeah. whole of knowledge. So I realized I needed to ask about that. I needed to ask where puppies were raised and that like starting to ask those questions led to a whole nother avenue of questions. So a breeder can be anything from like a backyard breeder to a puppy mill to like an mm -hmm. excellent breeder that really should have some sort of document that shows how amazing they are because it's just like decades of knowledge. And yeah. yet we have ourselves in this um in this space because there's nothing like that tells people that this is how good you are it's not like being a mm -hmm. doctor where like you have this reputation because you went to this college so I really wanted to go to the complete alternate end of the spectrum of the dogs that we had tested out before I got to poodles and cavapoos and we actually really wanted to get into cavaliers but we just couldn't because my son would break out in hives and I was like Okay. But I still want Cavaliers in our lives. So we did that. Mm -hmm. That was a conflict because so many people think that if you're a doodle breeder, anything that's mixed, you must mm -hmm. be a backyard breeder because so many doodle breeders are. Yeah. And there's a stigma to it that really needs to be dissuaded. People need to understand that just because people may be doodle breeders or do specific mixes for specific purposes does not make them a backyard breeder. Like asking yeah. the questions will solve um, will solve the question of whether or not a person is doing it right. So things that I do that set us apart, and I'm in a community of women who do these things. So mm -hmm. like in finding out what is best for our puppies and doing the research, I found that there's a whole community of people <clears throat> who really feel passionate about it like I do, that want puppies that support families that like really can start off well so mm -hmm. 
um, things that set me apart, I really love the puppy culture program. It sets our puppies up for success by just the exposure with the early neurological stimulation and um, doing like the early scents. That's more of the badass breeder program. I'm kind of, I've kind of created my own where I like parts of it, more of it is puppy culture than the badass breeder program. I love the badass breeder program, but there's parts of it that I'm like, oh, I'm not, I don't, I have my own setup that I started before the badass breeder program existed. Yeah. At least on a broad spectrum, like I'm sure I found out about it like long after it was created. But um, so I kind of have my own little niche and I love to focus on once puppies are older, we're working on like all kinds of sound exposure when they're young with like a CD that kind of gets them desensitized to sounds, yeah. motion, being underfoot, like not necessarily underfoot because we want to keep them safe, but in our home, bringing them on car rides, having them be yeah. around safe families, like trusted friends and neighbors and the cousins come over constantly. All these things, along with having health tested parents, that's genetic testing and understanding what that means, like knowing how to pair. You can't just pair a dog to another dog. Mm -hmm. You need to know like what their strengths are and make it so that the pair is complementing so the puppies are better than the parents as you go down the line. Um, doing all of that and so genetic testing and OFA testing, making sure that everything is good. I've, I have washed so many dogs from our program because they were not worthy to be parents because we mm -hmm. wanted them to have puppies that were better and they just weren't the right candidate for the job. And that's yeah. okay. Like you've got me on a soapbox now, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Like, um, I think it is important because when people are asking me about breeders and where to get a puppy and how to know that it's like, a good puppy and I was like you've got to find someone that's health testing like that is so important because you know there's why are we breeding dogs that are going to have genetic issues it shouldn't yeah. be a thing we shouldn't be doing that so I can see no. why you are so passionate about it because it is a huge 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 issue and I see it all the time as a trainer just so sad that that's like that should be the minimum that should be the forefront like if you can't take the time to do any of the other things like that's really too bad but like if you're not at least health testing the parents and making sure that they're really like the best that they can be or you know that the thing that they have that's not perfect is something that you can improve with time that's not going to have negative effects on the puppies if you don't know that stuff like how why are you doing it just for the money yeah. not enough that's not enough of a reason. And there's so many people think that you can just make money by breeding puppies. And if you are making money like right away, then you're cutting so many corners. You're not doing any of the things because you should have lots of expenses up front. There should be like a lot of investment going into your stock, like to your moms and dads. There should be so much health testing and it's so expensive, so much enrichment activities. They cost time and money. So mm -hmm. Yeah, like families just need to be educated on what to look for in breeders. Um, and then hopefully, eventually, puppy mills and backyard breeders should be a thing of the past. It should be so difficult to get in. And I make it actually kind of difficult for my families because I ask them a lot of questions. That's the other part, the other side of this coin that's like, people will accuse me of being a backyard breeder or um, a puppy mill. And I'm like, if you knew what that was, you wouldn't even accuse me of that. Like five mm -hmm. puppies being well loved in a home constantly with their mom running around, getting the enrichment environment is not a puppy mill, is not a backyard breeder, mm -hmm. paired with all the health testing that goes into it. Mm -hmm. So them knowing what to ask is going to make all the difference. And hopefully eventually this will be a thing in the past having puppy mills and backyard breeders. I don't know if we'll ever get there, but I would love to see the shelters empty, you know? Mm -hmm people think that we contribute to that but I make it so difficult for our families to actually get approved for a puppy I want to know that this puppy is like wanted sought after love desired it's not just a status symbol to have a puppy it's a companion and their family and so I'm looking for that kind of commitment when I find my families and there's a whole support system that goes into every single one of my puppies they're always able to reach out to me if there's ever a problem a puppy can come back to me I don't I will do anything to keep my puppies out of shelters. And if mm -hmm. I, can, like, if I'm in a part of my life where I just can't do that, say like I'm in the hospital or something, 
then I'm going to be there to support them finding a new home because we're keeping that puppy out of a shelter. We don't yeah. contribute to that because we care. It's the people who don't care that just get a puppy because they think it would be fun. And then they just bring it to a shelter. But none mm-hmm. of my family like that. Their puppies are family. So yeah. when people accuse us of like filling the shelters, I'm sure there are breeders that are like that, but so many of us are not. It's so good to see that because, I don't know, I see the after effects of dogs going into the shelter or getting a puppy and then going, this isn't right for me and then sending them to the shelter. And then we've got all sorts of issues from the shelter, but then we also have the the issues that came from not being properly socialized and health tested and all that stuff. So it's just, it's, it's crazy. So you work so hard to keep them. Yeah, it gets worse as like they get passed from place to place and all the trauma that comes mm-hmm. with that, unpacking that. And I, I love that people will go to shelters and put in the time and the effort and to a dog that really deserves a second chance. Many of them don't get a second chance. But there are a lot of people that they, they can't have that kind of commitment in their lives. They need a dog that supports them, that's prepared for a life that they already have set in place. They can't set aside so many hours a day to help a dog recover from this trauma that they've been through. And so like, there's definitely space for everybody to do their best. You know, when it comes to the love of dogs, they deserve a second chance. They deserve to have better human interaction to not Mm -hmm. be in an shelter but there are so many people that just aren't in a place where they can do that but they need the companionship and the support and the service that dogs offer from homes that train them for that purpose yeah so can you kind of um talk to us about like what health testing actually means like when we're looking at that are you just testing like tips or what what is it that you actually are looking for when you say this is a a dog that's worth breeding or we're going to wash it from the program what are you looking for as far as health sure that's a really good that's a really good question and a lot of breeders don't even know the basics of this so I think it's really good to go over um So there are a lot of aspects that go into deciding whether or not a dog is worthy to be bred. And there's a lot more for males than there are for females. I'll say that much because when you're looking for a male, if you're looking for a stud that is able to be excellent for many females, like Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that he is um, able to apply to a broad spectrum, you know? And so if he has any imperfections in his genetics, that's almost a deal breaker every time. Mm -hmm. Unless he has other contributing factors that make him very hard to find, like like having like a dark color that is almost impossible to find, but he carries one copy of something. You just have to be aware of that and carry him to a female that doesn't have that copy. Because in the breeding world, most of the time, if you have two copies, that is a case in which a puppy, like if a parent has one copy and another parent has a copy, that's a case where a puppy could end up with two copies and then be affected by a disease. But one copy will never allow them to show um, any symptoms. So can that's you tell me, sorry, can you tell me what you mean by like a copy? Uh, just a, an example of what type of a genetic sure. issue that would be. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, um, with every breed, there are certain diseases that are common to the breed that affects them more than maybe it would affect a different breed. So okay. for instance, like in poodles, progressive retinal atrophy has to do with the eyes and can lead to blindness if they have two copies. I've learned one that you can do really early to rule out whether or not a dog has potential that can save you a lot of heartache. It's testing eyes first through a certified okay veterinary ophthalmologist. And then with OFA, I do hips, um, patella, elbows, and I can never remember all the tests, but the hips is the most important one. Mm-hmm. Oh, and heart. Heart is yes. like with Cavaliers, you have to test heart. Um, and I always kind of tend to over test. There's other tests that people do, like they'll test their poodle's thyroid. Um, but I've never, like, I'll have their blood tested and that will tell you kind of whether or not there are any. So hips is something that, and I like to do pen hips for my boys. Pen hip is like, you get an actual number. 
that tells okay. you whether or not they're above or below the breed average. If they're above a certain number, their hips are too loose. You don't want to pass on loose hips to puppies that can then have like hip dysplasia and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So that one is like a deal breaker, but aside from like actual OFA testing and genetic testing, there's so many things that um, come into play even before that. Like I evaluate them kind of as puppies. Is their structure mm -hmm. nice and square? How are their legs positioned? And that's like its whole learning curve of finding out how a dog and what breed, like what's it supposed to look like? How's their top line? What is their facial structure like? Do they have any issues with their mouth? Like, do they have an underbite or an overbite? Is everything like a poodle should have a proper scissor bite where the teeth kind of like come together, slide next to each other and there's no conflict where the teeth are kind of yeah. um, eating each other's space. And then there's like, is if a male has an undescended testicle, that's a deal breaker oftentimes because if you have a testicle that's undescended, that can lead to cancers and it's really not mm -hmm. something want to be passing on down although there's some a lot of these things are sometimes controversial um whether or not it's genetic or if it's just like a fluke you know does it pass on mm -hmm. there's not tons of research to back up whether or not it does so some breeders yeah. will have like one testicle removed the one that was inside and then there's still an excellent stud dog you know okay. so there's some mm -hmm. controversy over that and I haven't decided really how I feel about it but um as long as the stud is healthy in that regard then there's potential for puppies to have not have bad issues so there's some things where it's like it's a deal breaker the, the hips are way mm -hmm. too loose or there's a cataract you can't breed a dog that has a cataract it's known that that kind of thing passes on to puppies but there's other things where it's like well their temperament is they're a little bit high energy so let's breed them to somebody a little bit calmer mm -hmm. you know or their top line isn't quite right so let's make sure that the stud has a better structure that way than she does mm -hmm. There's like improvement over time versus like, okay, we have to wash this dog. They have two okay. puppies. That won't work, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I guess one of the other things I really want to talk about is the early neurological stimulation that you do with those puppies. Um, I see puppies that come from breeders that do that. And I am amazed with how well they're able to kind of, um, overcome some traumatic experiences that they may come. Can you kind of explain what that does? I know it's supposed to kind of set them up for overcoming stress in their life. Is that correct? Is that my, is my understanding, right? Yeah. So, I mean, every dog is going to have a different experience in life. So some traumas are not going to be things that they can just overcome, mm -hmm. but when they're puppies and you have this kind of magical window between like day three to day I want to say it's 16 mm -hmm. you have this magical window where <clears throat> their hands are so malleable and they're being taught right away what is okay what is acceptable is this kind of interruption all right mm -hmm. and so that amazingly can transcribe into down the line them being more tolerant and being able to recover quicker from things that are maybe startling and so this kind of early neurological stimulation, you rub the ears, you touch the nose, um, you're doing this like up down motion, it makes them have stronger circulation, um, better, like stronger hearts, a more tolerance to touch and being kind of like, even temperature, just making everything function better. Mm -hmm. I am terrible at explaining it, but I've seen how it is so beneficial for my puppies and I've gotten dogs from other breeders that have done the same thing and seen the same results. But I've also gotten dogs from breeders that haven't done this. And I'm like, well, I can kind of see that this dog struggles with this. And not every puppy is gonna have a harder time because yeah. they have it. Maybe they are more resilient just naturally. But these mm -hmm. puppies like um, Yuletide here who struggles with being um, confident and knowing that things are okay, that early exposure is a definite leg up, you know, mm -hmm. it makes, it makes them have a higher chance of being able to tolerate stressful things in life and interruptions and things that would otherwise to their kind of more sweet, tender nature, um, would be distressing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, um, for kind of going over that. I, um, I just really, I've loved working with you in our program, but I've loved watching how your, um, 
your program has just taken off and grown and it's just it's so nice to see people that actually care and they're actually doing things to help set these puppies up for more success in their life because puppyhood is already stressful enough for people <laughs> without you know without any but you help kind of bridge that gap and make things a little bit easier with your puppies especially with all the stuff that you're doing like the crate training and you start some potty training and stuff like that your puppies have a leg up going into these homes above you know puppies that don't have any of that even that experience like I watch you do crate training and that's probably one of the biggest things I get talked to about with puppies is my puppy screams in the kennel and you start out and you just have this process and the process I give them is very similar to what you're doing with them, but you have the time and you just sit there and that's what you're doing. And so it's, you set those puppies up for a lot more success just because they have already had those experiences. And I don't know, it's just been really fun to watch you working with the puppies and really just. Make me cry. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I have loved working with you too. Like when I first originally met you and we were working with Athena and then we did Freya and Luna and Diana going through the training program. I loved doing that aspect of it so much with the older dogs, but I was like, wouldn't it be awesome if we could do the crate training? So I didn't, because <clears throat> Athena and Freya were hard. They were hard. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this doesn't need to be this way. Why don't mm -hmm. we just make it easy? for everybody who ever gets a puppy from me, you know? Yeah. And hearing you like give me that praise. I love that. Thank you so much, Sarah. <laughs> yeah, you're welcome. Like it is not any difference for, for people when they have a puppy that's already, I mean, when they're in that really important time frame. I mean, you've got socialization period from five weeks to like 16 weeks is the latest. And you're doing, I tell people, if you have a good breeder, your breeders put so much time and effort into this socialization. You can't not finish it. You have to finish it. It's so oh, important. Yeah. Um, and so I tell people you finish, if you, if you are investing in this puppy that they've had so much time and effort put into them and you just bring them home and you don't do anything else, you're going to lose all of that hard work that that breeder has put into. So it's not something that you just like, yeah, I am paying for this dog that is well bred they've had so much stuff done you can't just bring them home and then just expect them to be fine you have to continue to put that work in but like I said it makes it so much easier to kind of transition into a home where they've already had an excellent excellent start so oh absolutely yeah people just have to understand that they have to keep on going like you can't just like stop the book like right in the middle you'll never mm -hmm. finish then you won't remember and they won't remember what they were taught either so yeah absolutely absolutely well awesome thank you so much for talking to me um about your program um it's I love hearing different perspectives and things like that I'm going to be chatting with someone about rescue and her experience and that aspect and I wanted to talk with someone that actually is what I would say if you're going to get a dog through a breeder, you want someone like Freckle uh, family to, I mean, I send people to your thing or to your Instagram and say, go watch what she does. This is what you want. If you're going to go through a breeder, this is what you're looking for. Um, and so I appreciate your time and your expertise. Of course. And thank you so much for interviewing me and asking all these great questions. I feel like people just need a little bit of information. They don't know where to look. And so, mm -hmm. and I am always sending people to you. I'm so glad that I have cards that I could send home with yeah. my puppies now. So my families know, like, this is a great resource for getting puppies kind of like keep going with that mm -hmm. training, going with that social, that social exposure, you know? So thank you so yeah. much for supporting us in this journey. I love that we're kind of in it together. And yeah. like just working towards the betterment of dogs, you know, keeping, taking yeah. care of them. We're really the caregivers. But what made me choose your program was I loved that it was in person. Um, I really benefit from being in person just because mm -hmm. I want to see other people kind of like in the class. And also it gives me the motivation. It's like, you know how we talk about <laughs> pack um, pressure. Yeah. yeah. 
it was like, I needed that. And so um, I wanted to do it for that reason, get me out of the house. And also it was kind of more like an, another level of social exposure for Athena. So mm-hmm. I'll just talk about Athena because that was my first experience. Yeah, getting but, um, and I loved, I just loved being there with other people feeling supported and also kind of an accountability. And you can get that by doing it online. And I, I love that. Some people get more out of it online because then they can fit it into their day better. But I needed something that was like, I could be in the grit. I wanted to feel like we were doing it together in person. I could meet people. And um, so that's why I got into doing it that way. Um, but with Athena, she was like the queen of the house. And the hardest part And I think this is the way for anybody who really loves their dog is like putting their foot down and being like, you are not the boss. I am the boss and I expect you to actually behave yourself. And there Mm -hmm. was hard, I think we were like two and a half or three weeks in where Athena was just so deflated and she's just stunning and wonderful. Right. And Mm -hmm. it crushed me to have to follow through sometimes, you know, Mm -hmm. You don't want to see your dog sad, but you're doing everything right. You're not being abusive. You're really just teaching them. And it's the same way with kids. Like they don't want to necessarily behave all the time, but you still Mm -hmm. show up as a parent. You can't be their best friend when you're teaching them necessarily because you have to put your foot down. And that was the hardest part, just doing that and being consistent. But once we got past this little like bubble of deflation that she was in, (laughs) once we got past that, she was like, oh now it can be fun it's like learning how to play the piano for a little while it's just not that I know how to play the piano but for a little while (laughs) it's like awful and you don't want to do it and it just feels like you'll never get past this point Mm -hmm. but once we got past that and we stayed consistent I just saw her blossom all of a sudden the world was open to her and she knew that she was safe even though she was like 100 feet away from me I could be behind a tree and she would just stay and then she knew to come to me and when she when we won the um, top dog training I don't know if you remember but I had never won anything and I didn't win this either really she won it but it was us together as a team and I had never like oh, there'll be never be an experience like that for me maybe ever again except for with the dog because because when your dog will listen to you and you can listen to them that communication is open and when we won that in that moment we were going up against like German shepherds and poodles and doodles I couldn't believe that you won I was like how you're so smart first of all but I also have this bond to you now that we've been through this training and there's just nothing like it so You'll never regret going through training with your dog, but I, I, I felt like this complete trust. Um, and also like, I know everybody probably feels like bonded to you in a way that is also like attached to their dogs once they go through your training program, but like you being able to guide people through this process and teach them how to get through this and being able to communicate with their dogs better in a way that like makes their lives so much higher quality because they're in it together is just amazing to me. And so thank you so much for all that you've done to help people and guide people through the process. Like I will never forget that moment. And the, every moment that we've been through with my other dogs and their training has been special in their own different ways. But knowing mm-hmm. from that first training, how incredible, like we can trust our dogs and they can trust in us. We put in the time. Um, there's just nothing like it. And I'm really grateful that I put in the time and decided to go with your program. Well, I'm, I loved having you in class every single time. You just um, brought a great energy and you just, I loved watching you work with each one of your dogs. You just could see the love that you both had for each other. And that's, I think one of my favorite things is watching. Um, a lot of times people come in very frustrated and by the end, you can just see how you the, how you look at each other. It's so different at the end of the program. It's just, I think that's one of my favorite parts. And I was so excited when you won Top Dog. I was just like, that was so, so, so deserved because you worked so hard with her. And I was just really, um, so I get so excited for the people that win. And everyone does a really great job, but I love doing that Top Dog competition just at the end. And I was so excited for you. So. 
Yeah. And I was, I'm not a competitive person. I'm not, I went into the wrong <laughs> business because like, this is more competitive than so many other aspects of life. <laughs> but I'm like, you know what? Let's just try. <laughs> and it worked out. It's funny. I have a lot of people like, well, we won't win. And I was like, don't say you won't win. Like jump in there, have fun. It's not about like winning. It's about having fun, but it's always fun when someone was like, I did not think that was going to happen. And I'm like, believe in yourself and trust the training because you're working hard. Um, do you feel like that? Like trust the pro I, I tell a lot of people, you got to trust the process. Cause like you were saying, even like at week three, you kind of were like, and this is not standstill, but that's a really normal time frame. Week three is a hard week for like everybody. And I'm always telling people, just trust the process. I promise it gets better. And I think there's a lot of people that don't believe me. Um, and so do you, have you found, cause you've brought through, I think five dogs now, like, have you found that trusting that process? I mean, it's going to look different for every dog, but trusting that process that it is going to click and you are going to get that um, relationship. Is that something you found true with your dogs? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it, it felt different. Like that stage where they were kind of realizing that this is not a temporary thing where we're, oh, we're doing this, that stage where they were kind of like, crap, now I have to behave myself. <laughs> Getting past that was, it looked different for each one of them, but it absolutely happened for each one. I saw the gears moving and I know that it's this way for so many dogs, but when a poodle starts to really understand something, they get this kind of like human, like look in their eye, like, okay, well then I'll do it then, you know? Mm -hmm. And so it's absolutely true. You get past that little rut, but if you, if you don't, um, have a trust in the process, like you said, then you'll never get past that. And you'll never see their eyes kind of light up like, okay, I'm kind of like, I'm kind of like on equal footing with you now. Like we have an understanding where before it was like, I would just misbehave, get in trouble and misbehave and get in trouble. Mm -hmm. And now there's an understanding that wasn't there before. And you do get there. You just have to keep going. Yeah. Well, awesome. Um, I guess here's the last question I have for you. Was it worth all the time and effort that it took um, in that in our program with each of your dogs? Was it worth it? Um, um, it is a lot of work. <laughs> so. well, for sure. But I feel like anything in life that's worth doing is going to take work. So if you don't want to put in the work, then don't get a dog. Like some people just need to hear that. Like a dog is not necessarily like any other pet, like a cat. You're kind of a pet to them. You do what they want and then they will come into your life when they want to. But a dog is like, you are everything to a dog. So if you're not willing to put in the work, then don't get one because mm -hmm. they're relying on you to be everything, you know, mm -hmm. it was absolutely. 100% no regret, regrets worth the work it took. So. Awesome.